Welcome to class, everybody. My name is Ben Gramico. I'm from InterNACHI. That's the International Association of Certified Home Inspectors. And in this class, we're going to learn how to perform a home inspection according to the InterNACHI Home Inspection Standards of Practice. And we're going to inspect this house. It's a townhouse. InterNACHI, the International Association of Certified Home Inspectors, is a fairly tax-exempt 501c6 nonprofit trade organization headquartered here in Boulder, Colorado. And InterNACHI is the world's leading organization of residential and commercial property inspectors. And if you visit our homepage at nachi.org, let's do that now. Our focus is helping home inspectors succeed. We can get you started. We can help you make more money. We can help you grow your business. The InterNACHI School is the only nationally accredited tuition-free college for home inspectors. And we're accredited by the U.S. Department of Education. And we're also a member college of the National Association of Career Colleges of Canada. So if you wanted to learn more about the Home Inspector College, go to internachi.edu. And if you're looking for home inspection training classes, courses, or a school or organization, make sure it has the .edu at the end. And for everything you need, all in one place, go to that URL, nachi.org slash everything, nachi.org slash everything. And there you'll find a 15 step checklist, a step by step checklist on how to become and continue to be a successful home inspector. So we have everything you need to be a trained, certified, qualified home inspector and to operate your own successful home inspection business. And step one is to join InterNACHI. Why join InterNACHI? Well, that opens up a whole world of opportunity for you when you are a member of the world's largest organization of residential home inspectors. So that's at nachi.org slash everything. All right, let's inspect this home according to the InterNACHI Home Inspection Standards of Practice. If you wanted to watch other inspectors perform an inspection according to the standards of practice, you're essentially following along, go to NACHI TV, N-A-C-H-I dot TV. And there you'll see a ton of online videos that you could watch. They're free and open to everyone. And you can watch certified master inspectors perform home inspections according to the standards of practice and also um, write inspection reports. And it's all free and online. So we're going to perform a home inspection according to the standards of practice. Where are the standards? That's at nachi.org SOP, N-A-C-H-I dot org slash SOP. Go there because we're going to refer to it a lot through this class. And there you'll find the home inspection, home inspection standards of practice. And it's chunked into different sections. So there's the roof section, the exterior section, basement foundation, crawl space structure, heating, cooling, plumbing, electrical, fireplace, etc. So if you go to the first section, roof, that's the first section in the standards of practice, and you'll see what a home inspector is required to do, what a home inspector is required to inspect and not required to inspect, what a home inspector is required to describe and report in the inspection report. So for example, under roof, in the roof section, the inspector shall inspect from the ground level or eaves. And that's important. You're not required to walk upon any roof surface, but you are you are required to walk. Um, you are required to inspect the roof. So you're required to inspect the roof from the ground level or eaves. And what are you required to inspect? What components of the roof system? Well, the roof covering materials, the gutters, the downspouts, the vents flashing, skylights, chimney, and other roof penetrations, the general structure from the roof, of the roof, from the readily accessible panels, doors, and stairs. The inspector is also required to describe the type of roof covering materials, so asphalt shingle or tile. The inspector is required to report, as in need of correction, any observed indications of active roof leaks how important the standards of practice is. 
it is the foundation upon which to build your inspection process for any home. And also, you can use it as an outline for your inspection report. So let's inspect this house according to the standards of practice. The first section of the standards of practice is the roof, like we just saw. You're not required to walk upon any roof surface. Now you could exceed the standards of practice by doing a few things like bringing a tall ladder and getting up to the gutter edge or the eaves or walking upon the roof surface, but you're not required to walk upon any roof surface. Even if it's a, a flat roof, 10 feet above the, above the ground. Um, it's a dangerous situation when you are walking up, leaving the earth and going on a ladder. If you fall and slip, um, it could be very dangerous, fatal. So we do not require anyone to walk upon any roof surface or use any ladders. It's not required. So the question is, do you exceed or not exceed the standards of practice? Fortunately, InterNACHI asked our legal counsel to write a letter or an opinion, and it's at that URL. Sorry, it's such a long URL, but it's natchiorg slash exceed hyphen or hyphen not hyphen exceed. Exceed or not exceed. So when in doubt about what the SOP standards of practice requires in a particular situation, you should err on the side of caution and exceed what the standards require. It's better to do a little more than what may be required than to do less and risk a potential claim and harm to your reputa reputation. So it's okay if you exceed the standards of practice. Remember, the home inspection standards of practice are the absolute minimum of what you are required to do and not required to do. So in this inspection that I performed, we're going to review oh, a couple hundred inspection images of an inspection on this house that I performed. And I got up on the roof and I took a picture of everything that I inspected on the roof. So what are you required to inspect on a roof? Well, if you don't know how to inspect a house roof, fortunately, InterNACHI has free online training at the URL natchiorg slash education. So if you go there, it's pretty straightforward. You scroll down and you type in into the search field roof. So we have many roof courses and they're free and online to InterNACHI members. There's a roof data technician course. There's a general roof inspection training video course. There's an advanced residential roof inspection course. There's a course for South Africa home inspectors. They're inspecting slate roofs, so it goes on and on. We have many courses, free and online, to help you gain the knowledge, skills, and abilities you need to inspect a roof. According to the Home Inspection Standards of Practice, the inspector shall inspect from ground level or the eaves, the roof covering materials, the gutters, the downspouts, the vents, flashing, skylights, chimney, and other roof penetrations, and the general structure of the roof from the readily accessible panels, doors, and stairs. So what are the roof covering materials? Well, it's pretty easy. It's what you see on the roof surface. That's the roof covering materials. And we call it the roof covering materials because we're not actually inspecting the roof system. The roof system includes, oh, just about everything in relation to the um, components that are assembled together for the roof system. So code in the IRC, International Residential Code, chapter nine, it talks about roof assemblies. A roof assembly includes the roof deck, substrate, or thermal barrier, insulation, vapor retarder, and roof covering. 
The types of roof covering materials though are asphalt shingles, clay and concrete tile, metal roof shingles, roll roofing, slate, etc. So what a home inspector should be using, what terminology a home inspector should be using is very important. You are actually observing the roof covering materials. You're not actually inspecting the roof assembly or the roof system because you can't see everything that is assembled together, all the components. You can't see, for example, the fasteners or um, the underlayment, right? Or the roof deck. So only observe and comment upon what you see. So a home inspection is a visual only inspection. So it's essentially like getting both hands, tie them behind your back and perform a visual only inspection. So um, in relation to the roof system, I'm required to inspect the roof, but I'm not going to comment upon the fastening, the underlayment, um, the sealants or anything like that. Anything that I can't see. So we refer to the roof covering materials. And on this roof, we have some major defects. So the it's a three tab shingle. And then there are a lot of cracks. And someone has been up there trying to seal up the cracks with some roof cement. And that's a, um, a bad patch. That's a temporary problem. So here's one shingle tab that is cracked off and it has exposed the shingle material underneath and also a fastener. And any fastener with an exposed head is a potential water entry point. So that's no good. There's another one and more defects. So this roof is a major defect and need of replacement. So I, as a home inspector, am going to look for signs of or indications of active roof leaks. Here's the front porch roof. That too is in bad shape. So according to the home inspection standards of practice, a home inspection report is that thing that I produce for my client so that they can read about my observations and my recommendations. The inspection report shall identify in written format defects within specific systems and components defined by the standards. Okay, so in the standards, we're required to inspect the roof covering materials and I just observed a lot of defects in that component or in that roof covering system. So I am required to report upon those things that are both observed, I saw them, and deemed to be material by the inspector. And a material defect is defined in the standards of practice as something very serious, something that's going to um, have an adverse impact on the value of the home or is going to hurt somebody. So the the systems and components that I'm required to inspect according to the standards of practice, I'm going to gauge on whether one, I have to both observe and deem it to be material, right? If I don't observe a defect, it won't appear in my report. It's beyond the scope of my inspection. I didn't see it. And if I didn't deem it to be material, according to the standards of practice, it won't be in my inspection report either. It's not required to be. If there is a material defect and I deem it to be material and I see it during my inspection, it ought to appear in my inspection report. All other types of defects are not required, according to the standards of practice, to be in the inspection report. However, the reality is your client is going to ask you to find all the problems that you can find. So um, a cosmetic defect, which is like a, a flaw or a blemish, a discoloration, let's say it's a stain in the carpeting. It's not required to be in the inspection report. However, if my client wants me to comment upon it, take a picture and put it in the report, I can choose to do that or not. But according to the standards of practice, inspection report shall written, shall be, um, shall identify in written format defects specified in the standards of practice that are both observed by me, the inspector, and are deemed by me as a material defect. Okay. Inspection reports may include additional comments and recommendations. And that's where 
Um, if you'd like to identify other types of defects, you can. So are there other types of defects that I may observe during an inspection? Yep. Well, what kind are there? Well, in the Internet G glossary of terms, if we go there now, go to the glossary and enter defect into the search field and click search and scroll down a little bit. You'll see that in the glossary there are four different types of defects defined. The cosmetic defect that we just mentioned is that blemish on the on the carpeting. It's a superficial flaw or blemish in the appearance of a system or component that does not interfere with its safety or functionality. A minor defect is something like um, a, a problem that a homeowner could fix, maybe a dirty air filter. A major defect is a problem um, where we need a professional contractor to come in and fix it. Let's say that roof with all those cracks that may be contributing to moisture intrusion, roof leaks, we need a professional to fix that. And a material defect, well, we haven't come across one yet, but it's something that's going to maybe hurt somebody. So that would be um, maybe a deck, uh, a deck that's attached to the house poorly, and it's about to fall, and a collapse, a deck collapse is imminent. So that would be an example of a material defect. So here's a major defect. We need a professional roofing contractor to come in and replace the entire roof. What else am I required to inspect according to the Home Inspection Standards of Practice that's related to the roof? Well, we inspected the roof covering materials, major defect. The gutters. Well, there are gutters on this house. I inspected them. They're dirty and filled with debris and um, rocks and there's a tennis ball there. So they need to be cleaned. That recommendation will be in my report. What else? Downspouts. Well, there's only a couple. Um, there's one there, and it goes underground. It doesn't go on a, a surface drainage uh, tray or discharge tray. So um, it goes underground. Remember, this is a visual-only inspection. A home inspector is not required to comment upon anything that's buried, essentially. So I don't know where that goes. And there's the other downspout in the front of the house. What else? Well. The vents, flashing, skylights, chimney, and other roof penetrations. The vents, well, there's a ridge vent at the top of the roof, and there's a soffit vent at the eaves there. So that's a even that's a, a ideal way of ventilating a roof. And from within the attic, I could see the baffles that allow air to um, not be blocked by the insulation in the attic space at the soffit. Flashing. Well, flashing is um, typically metal, um, pieces of metal that are installed in a way to divert water away from uh, a particular area and um, to control that and to prevent moisture intrusion. So there's um, a, a parapet wall in between the two townhomes, and I see step flashing installed. And counter flashing is the large. Um, piece of metal flashing that's bent over and fastened and then the step flashing you can see just a little bit here and there there's the step flashing stepped along with the rows of shingles there's flashing there and this is exposed step flashing because one shingle is actually missing and there's flashing where the roof intersects anything else. So here's a couple of things that the roof covering materials intersect the siding or the wall. There's some flashing there. And there's some flashing here where the, the roof shingles and the plane of the roof intersect the, the masonry. And this is improperly installed. So you could see that the step flashing was installed underneath the shingle, but the top edge of the flashing is open. There is no counter flashing like we saw previously at the parapet wall. So this is prone to water penetration. This needs to be fixed. This is a, um, a fix that 
a homeowner can't do. So it's a major defect. Skylights are required to be inspected, and we don't have any skylights. Chimney. Chimneys are required to be inspected, and we um, have not a fireplace chimney, but another type of chimney. It's a, it's a gas vent for the furnace, it seems like, or maybe the hot water tank or both. I haven't been in the house yet, so I'm not sure. But um, there's the termination cap and the pipe coming up, a bit of a hail dent on it. That's okay. There's the collar and flashing around the vent pipe. So if you don't know how to inspect chimneys or vent pipes, we have an actual online course, free online to InterNACHI members on how to inspect these systems and components. Everything looks okay there. And other roof penetrations. I'm required to inspect other roof penetrations. What could that be? Um, the plumbing vent pipe that comes through the roof. And that's in need of a fix because um, the rubber flashing membrane around the pipe itself has deteriorated and it's been coated with some black asphalt sealant, which is just really a Band-Aid repair. So according to the Home Inspection Standards of Practice, still inside the roof section of the Standards of Practice, a home inspector shall describe the type of roof covering materials. And it's a three tab asphalt shingle. According to Home Inspection Standards of Practice, the inspector shall report as in need of correction observed indications of active roof leaks. Okay. In the attic, I find observed indications of active roof leaks. Now, it may be dry. It may be um, not registering with my hand or a moisture meter, um, but I'm going to identify it as an active roof leak unless the homeowner can tell my client that the existing homeowner or occupant um, can tell my client that it has been fixed. Well, we know it hasn't been fixed because um, of the condition of the roof covering materials that we saw previously. So all of these watermarks are going to be written up as observed indications of active roof leaks for sure. The next section is exterior. According to the Home Inspection Standards of Practice, we have to inspect the exterior. If you don't know how to inspect the exterior, that's okay. Um, we have online accredited courses, accredited by the U.S. Department of Education at internachi.edu. And if you go to our curriculum webpage and type in exterior, you'll find all of our exterior courses. So right there, there's search for courses and I'll type exterior. And we have several. Um, here's exterior safety for inspectors and contractors. How to inspect the exterior course. I like that one. Fundamentals of inspecting the exterior course. My buddy teaches that one. Advanced stucco and eaves inspection training. So it goes on and on and on. According to the Home Inspection Standards of Practice, the home inspector shall inspect. So I don't know if you've caught on the pattern of the Home Inspection Standards of Practice, but it's kind of grouped in three things. For each section of the Standards of Practice, you're required to inspect, describe, and report. Inspect, describe, report. So here's what the, the difficult one is the inspection section. So the inspector shall inspect the exterior wall covering materials, the eaves, soffit, and fascia, a representative number of windows, all exterior doors, flashing, and trim, adjacent walkways and driveways, stairs, steps, stoops, stairways, and ramps, porches, patios, decks, balconies, and carports, railings, guards, and handrails, and vegetation, surface drainage, retaining walls, and grading of the property where they may adversely affect the structure due to moisture intrusion. That's a lot to inspect. So. Let's go over each item, line by line, step by step. We are required to inspect the exterior wall covering materials. What's that? Well, according to code, the International Residential Code, wall coverings is in Chapter 7 of the 2018 IRC. And this section talks about various types of materials um, and methods of applying the exterior materials um, in relation to the interior and the exterior wall coverings. And the interior wall coverings include the drywall, the plaster, the gypsum board, ceramic towel, wood veneer, 
on and on. The exterior wall coverings include aluminum, stone, masonry, veneer, wood, hardboard, particle board, which are, and on and on and on. So again, just like previously, what terminology you use would be very helpful in your inspection report. So what we want to talk about are the exterior wall coverings. We're not code inspectors, we're home inspectors, but often we use code to help guide us. And the exterior wall coverings, well, there's brick in some small areas, but it's mostly plastic vinyl siding. And there's vinyl siding there, vinyl siding there. There's a, a repaired piece of vinyl siding. Um, this section is different from this section, different color, actually different style, different size, and another different section here. So maybe it was damaged and they replaced it. And there's a, a hole there and a crack. And there's some masonry, there's some stucco application to the stone foundation or poor concrete foundation. Sorry, I think it's a poor concrete. It could be CMU concrete masonry units. We'll take a look on the inside. There's a loose piece of vinyl flash, um, vinyl siding, exterior wall covering. There it is there. And you see the stucco application along the foundation. I think it's a poured concrete foundation now that I can see this window here. What else do we have to inspect? Eaves, soffit, and fascia. Well, the eaves, there's the eaves, and the soffit are the soffit vents we previously talked about in the roof section, right there. Representative number of windows, okay? Because we can't inspect the second floor windows without a ladder, and we're not required to have ladders. It's a representative number. So we'll take a look at the second floor windows but we won't actually be able to get close to them. So we'll look at a representative number of windows that we can actually reach, and they seem to be okay. There's the door, the sliding door, and the flashing around the window and the door, um, it's actually missing. So there's nothing here, it's just sealant. So they, they have an opening in the masonry foundation, and the, there's, there's a, there was a hole, an opening here, a gap, and they slid the door assembly in there, and then they just filled it with goopy silicone. I wouldn't worry too much about the sediment crack of the header. What else are we required to inspect? All of the exterior doors, all of them. Not a representative number, but all. And I'm looking for a trip hazard. There's not one here. And maybe some handrail issues. There's the steel lintel above the entry door to hold up the brick, masonry veneer. And at the bottom left corner, that looks okay. And the doorbell, I'll take a look at that. And there's the rear sliding door at the basement area. Adjacent walkways and driveways. So there's the front public walk and there's a walkway to the parking area in the back. The inspector shall inspect stairs, steps, stoops, stairways, and ramps. Well, there's only one step. Porches, patios, decks, balconies, and carports. Well, we really don't have any. Railings, guards, and handrails. We don't have any of those either. <laughs> Vegetation, surface drainage, retaining walls, and grading of the property where it may adversely affect it due to moisture intrusion. And I think that's okay. That looks pretty good. That grading is okay. There's some, you know, there's a retaining wall with some moisture up against there. There's a retaining wall here. It's starting to separate a little bit. Um, I don't see any major problems. The grading is okay here. According to the Home Inspection Standards of Practice, the inspector shall describe, first inspect, describe, then report, describe the type of exterior wall covering materials. And so we went over this. There's vinyl, there's brick, and there's some stucco masonry. And we're required to report as in need of correction any improper spacing between immediate spalisters, spindles, and rails, and we just don't have any. Now, on the outside, you can inspect other components as well. So all the water faucets, I'll inspect all the water faucets, see if it's 
um, frost-free hose bibs and uh, for a cold climate and um, see if there's running water and see if the handle is functional. The next section is the basement foundation crawl space and structure. According to the Home Inspection Standards of Practice, the inspector shall inspect the foundation, the basement, the crawl space, and structural components. So down in the basement, I'm going to look for, what was it? Foundation, basement, I don't have a crawl space, and structural components. Foundation, basement, structural components. If it's hard to remember what to inspect, well, I would suggest putting the standards of practice as a checklist within your software and use it on a mobile device so that you can use the standards of practice to guide your inspection process while you're inspecting. And your inspection software, if you use it on a mobile device, you can actually then write the report while you're inspecting. And it helps speed up your process and also helps you reduce making mistakes because you have the standards of practice right in front of you. So the basement is finished. We have some gypsum board, drywall, some drop ceiling tiles, a lot of personal storage items that are in the way. And I want to take pictures so that I can document what was the condition of the interior, very restrictive with personal items all over the place. So I can't see everything. The doors are concerned. It's very close to the um, patio here. Um, there isn't a whole lot of sealant. We saw the sealant problem on the outside. I'm not sure about water penetration. Sometimes they're splashing during a heavy rainstorm. And if the gutters are filled, right, and they're spilling over, then water can splash at this area here and splash inside the house. So I'm concerned about this area. And if you're wondering about how to inspect a home in relation to water intrusion, we have a free online course about that particular issue. You're not required to move any um, personal items and also you're not required to move drop ceiling tiles. Um, but I do, I exceed the standards of practice for all of my clients and I try to see structural components because that's what's required of the, the standards of practice. And I stick my camera up there and I take pictures and I'm looking for things, anything that might be a problem, one of the defect types. So I'm looking around going around the unfinished parts, the finished parts. There's a floor joist. Those are two by 10 floor joists and plywood flooring sheathing. There's insulation installed on the band rim joists. I don't see any major problems with the structure. And then I get out my moisture meter. Um, you don't, you're not required to have equipment like a moisture meter. Um, the standards of practice actually doesn't even mention a flashlight, but Every home inspector has a flashlight, maybe a screwdriver, a GFCI tester, and I have a moisture meter um, on a stick. It has pins, and it, if it finds moisture, it'll light up just like this. It's lighting up. That means it has detected some kind of moisture. I'm not measuring the moisture content. It's basically a, a very um, rudimentary way of seeing if something's wet. And it's wet here, and this is the interior inside corner trim area by the slider door hmm. and the carpet is wet so this is a wet area I don't have to diagnose problems but I, if I observe them I have to put them in the inspection report I take out my infrared camera again this is exceeding the standards of practice you're not required to have an infrared camera but it helps me describe what I'm seeing there's the image of the infrared camera and there's the image of the infrared camera on top of the, the actual inspection image that I took with my regular camera. And so that dark area is wet. I've confirmed it with my moisture meter. And if you're unable, if you're wondering how to perform an inspection using the infrared camera and a moisture meter, we have those free online courses for you as well. According to the Home Inspection Standards of Practice, the inspector shall describe the foundation type. I saw a little bit of it and the location of the access to the underfloor space. There are no underfloor spaces, but the foundation type is poor concrete foundation. So we have a, a few courses on um, structure, um, structural design, uh, foundations, foundation walls, describing um, about what to, how to build a foundation, what it's built out of, how to inspect it, and what are possible defects. According to the Home Inspection Standards of Practice, the inspector shall report as need of a correction 
Observe indications of wood in contact with or near soil. Observe indications of active water penetration. Observe the indications of possible foundation movements such as drywall cracks, brick cracks, out of square door frames, unlevel floors, and any observed cutting, notching, and boring of framing members that may, in the inspector's opinion, present a structural or safety concern. Well, we really only have right now observed indications of active water penetration. So I'll put that in the report as in need of correction. Next section is heating according to the standards of practice. The inspector shall inspect the heating system using normal operating controls. What does that mean? Thermostat. So there's the thermostat for the heating system. And this is actually a natural draft heating system. So from about 10 feet away, you sh every home inspector who's trained by energy should be able to describe the type of heating system, particularly in relation to its mm, category or efficiency type. So this is a category one natural draft, very inefficient and needs to be replaced simply because of its age. It's about 40 years old. <laughs> We have um, a free gas furnace inspection checklist available, and that's at that unfortunately long URL, natchiorg slash home hyphen inspection hyphen checklist. natchiorg home inspection checklist with hyphens. And let me show it to you real quick. So if you're wondering what to inspect, what should I inspect at a gas furnace? That's a little bit more detailed than the standards of practice. Well, we have it. Um, here's the gas furnace inspection checklist. You click it, you can download it as a Word document to edit or a PDF. And it goes through just about everything we can come up with about what to look at. Look at the switch, look at the cabinet, look at the required clearance, on and on. Look at the fan belt, look at the free rotation, look at the connection. So it goes on and even talks about the burners and manifold, the igniter and flames, light switches, it talks about combustion air and air distribution. And then we talk about the sequence of operation. And the sequence of operation is very simple when you're inspecting a gas furnace like this one. We'll leave that to you. Let's take a look. According to the home inspection standards of practice, the inspector shall describe the location of the thermostat, the energy source and heating method, and we have to report as a need of correction any system that didn't operate or I couldn't access. That's pretty easy. So the location of the thermostat system, there it is. Location of the thermostat of the heating system is there. Um, first floor dining room. The energy source, well, I see a gas valve and I saw a gas meter on the outside. And the heating method, well, there's the air filter so I know it's forced air with ductwork. The inspector shall report as a need of correction any heating system that didn't operate or if it was inaccessible. Well, it was accessible and it did operate. And there's the thermostat. And there's the furnace. There's the service switch. I turned it on for safety while I inspect it. There's a natural draft. There's a lot of rust and corrosion all over the place. So it's not venting properly. Could be hazardous actually. There's the manifold, the burner ports, a lot of rust and corrosion. I'm trying to get pictures of detailed components there, detailed pictures. There's the blower, there's the gas shutoff valve, and there's a problem with the air filter. The air filter has duct tape on top of it, so the, the opening slot for the air filter is, um, is not efficient. It needs to be sealed up. And there's the air filter there. And the ductwork has actual duct tape on it. So it's leaking air. And on top of the um, natural draft gas furnace appliance or unit is the air conditioner unit, the indoor coil. Behind that is the vent pipe for the exhaust gases, the chimney for the furnace and hot water tank. It's behind the, I can't see it very well. So I stick my camera behind it and turn on a flash, try to grab a couple pictures. And I'm concerned about the, looks like glue around one of the vent pipes. Um, and this is a type B vent pipe and it goes all the way up through. And remember the chimney on top of the roof that we saw with the termination cap metal with the hail dent. Yep. This is the same chimney stack. So I'm concerned about this as well as 
the age of the heating system is very, very old. While I'm back there, I also looked up and I saw that the dryer exhaust is open. So the dryer is actually venting a lot of moisture, heat, lint behind the furnace. So that's a defect. Cooling. According to the Home Inspection Standards of Practice, the inspector shall inspect the cooling system using normal operating controls, and there's the thermostat. The inspector shall describe the location of the thermostat for the cooling system and the cooling method. The inspector shall report and is in need of correction any cooling system that did not operate and the cool, if the cooling system was deemed to be inaccessible. Well, location of the thermostat. Where was it? Same location, same thermostat. The cooling method? Well, we have a split system where there's an air conditioner unit on the outside, the compressor, and the um, condenser on the inside there with the coil or a coil. And it's um, forced air, so there's air flowing through the system. Any cooling system that didn't operate? Well, it operated and it was accessible. So I inspected it. And on the outside, there's the manufacturing plate or label, and it's barely legible because it's such an old system. The unit seems stable, but the fins are really damaged and clogged. The suction line has insulation around it and it's in poor shape. There's an electrical disconnect, that's good. There's a condensate discharge tube, that's okay. Ideally, it would be discharging a little bit further away from the foundation. And there's a condensate pump and that looks pretty old too. You can see all the, the dryer lint resting on the condensate pump. And it's a very old unit. The next section, according to the standards of practice, is plumbing. The inspector shall inspect the main water supply shutoff valve, main fuel supply shutoff valve, water heating equipment, including the TPR valve, interior water supply, including all the fixtures and faucets by running the water, all the toilets for proper operation by flushing them, all the sinks, tubs, showers for functional drainage, the drain waste vent system, and drainage sump pumps with accessible floats if they're installed. So the main water shutoff valve is there in the basement. There it is shutoff valve, the meter itself. It's not leaking. I, I put my hand underneath the meter. There's another shutoff valve in case the meter needs to be replaced and the jumper cable. Main water, um, main fuel sh supply shutoff valve. So the fuel supply to the house is natural gas. There's the meter on the outside. I'll note the, the minor surface rust and there's the shutoff valve above the ground. Water heating equipment including the valves. So there's the hot water tank. It's 40 gallons. I took a picture of the manufacturing label. There's the shutoff of the cold water going into the tank. And there's the heating controls. There's a bag there. So I'm going to move the bag away because I know this is a fuel burning appliance. And when I did that, I see that there's a problem. We have a, a safety issue. Um, it's a material defect because it could hurt somebody. Um, there's scorching on the outside of the opening of the burner chamber. Why? I don't know. You're not required to diagnose these problems, but it could be that there's a drafting problem. Remember the, remember the, um, the connection of the pipes of the chimney stack, um, the type B vent connector pipes behind the furnace that I couldn't get to? There could be a problem there, and it's back drafting and heat really high excessive exhaust heat is coming out of the burner chamber instead of up the flue pipe. And so, hmm, that could be a problem. I don't know why, but it's not supposed to look like this. And there could be a carbon monoxide problem as well. So we don't want anybody hurt. There's the flue pipe and it's not installed very well. And it's not connected with a thimble very well and it's on hot and I'm going to leave it right there. The gas is on, the cold water shutoff valve there, and there's the temperature pressure relief valve, TPR valve, that extends to the floor. What else are we inspe uh, supposed to inspect according to the standards of practice? Well, the interior water supply including all fixtures and faucets by running the water and looking at all the toilets for flushing 
and drainage of the sinks, tubs, and showers. So in every bathroom, in the kitchen, and other areas, maybe a laundry sink, I'll run all the hot and cold water and make sure that the faucet, um, the fixture towards the left or on the left is hot and towards the right and on the right is cold and look for any kind of problems with drainage. So I'll flush the toilet, I'll run the sink and look at the flow of the shower and see if there's functional flow and look at the drainage of the tub and the toilet and the sink and see if it's functional there and includes that sink fixture. And the drain waste vent system, well, we didn't see a whole lot in the basement. There wasn't much of the piping, the main drain waste vent piping. Um, we saw the, if you recall, the roof penetration that had the problem around the vent stack um, and the sinks themselves that have traps. And there's the roof penetration pipe. And sump pumps, there aren't any sump pumps in the basement. The inspector shall describe whether the water supply is public or private. Well, it's public. The location of the main water supply shutoff valve, and that's in the basement. The location of the main fuel supply shutoff valve, and we saw that that's on the outside of the house. The location of any observed fuel storage system, we don't have any. It's natural gas. And the capacity of the water heating equipment, if labeled, and it is labeled, and it's 40 gallons. The inspector shall report inspect, describe, report as in need of correction, deficiencies in the water supply by viewing the functional flow in two fixtures operated simultaneously. So I'll flush the toilet, run the sink, and do the shower and see how well that works. Deficiencies in the installation of hot and cold water faucets. So I'll turn something towards the left. It should be hot towards the right. It should be cold. Active plumbing water leaks that were observed during the inspection. I didn't see any. Toilets that were damaged or had loose connections to the floor or were leaking or had tank components that didn't operate, all the toilets flushed well. Now, here's a recommendation to help you write a report that's easy to read and understand. You could group the bathrooms together in your inspection report. So this is the first floor half bath, that's the toilet, sink, GFCI, second floor bathroom, sink, GFCI, tub, there's a little damage to the floor there, GFCI, plumbing access panel, basement full bath, toilet, sink, GFCI, shower. That's just a recommendation. You don't have to. You have to think about using the standard as a guide for your inspection report and as a, a way to group systems and components and possibly rooms within your report. So you could think about inspecting systems like the heating system and then you could group rooms like all the interior rooms together or maybe all the bedrooms are grouped in your report under bedrooms or all the bathrooms are grouped in your report under bathrooms it's really up to you according to the standards of practice the electrical is next there's a lot to inspect according to the home inspection standards of practice the inspectors shall inspect the service drop overhead service conductors and attachment point service head, gooseneck, and drip loops, service masts, service conduit and raceway, the electric meter and base, the service entrance conductors, the main service disconnect, panel boards and overcurrent protection devices, fancy way of saying circuit breakers or fuses, service grounding and bonding, a representative number of switches, light fixtures, receptacles, including AFCIs, all the GFCIs, and the presence of smoke and carbon monoxide detectors. That's a lot to inspect. How do you remember what to inspect and how do you do Well, remember, if you have a mobile device and your inspection report software is on your mobile device, you can use it as a, a checklist, a step-by-step -step checklist, a guide, so that you can, um, you don't have to remember what to inspect. It's right there for you. So the service drop, what the heck is a service drop? Well, there are terminology um, there's terms and definitions for the electric uh, system and components and terminology related to the electrical service components is available in InterNACHI's free online how to perform residential electrical inspections course so let's go there let's take a look at one section called service terminology and it's under the the chapter service entrance and here's a picture 
of a service entrance cable. And let's go over these components here. And that will actually help us understand what we're supposed to inspect according to the standards of practice. So in this inspection picture, we have a blue arrow, three white arrows, three orange arrows, three red arrows. And the service entrance cable, the SEC, is that blue arrow. And that's that, in this picture, on this house, is that gray, thick gray line that goes down the house um, from the overhead conductors, down the house, and into the meter box on this house. And it's a line of service conductors, which are those white arrows. They're those three black wires located between the terminals of the service equipment. Well, that's the main disconnect, at the maybe at the panel or the equipment somewhere. And a point usually outside the building, clear of any of the walls, where they are joined by a tap, a splice, a connection, and that's the orange arrows to the service drop or overhead service conductors and that's the red arrows pointing at the overhead service conductors coming from the utility pole. The blue arrow, arrow is pointing to a protected or sheathed service entrance SE cable. Sometimes that protection is deteriorated on old cloth sheathing. Serve, the service point is the point of connection, that's the orange arrows, between the facilities of the service utility and the house's wiring. So the utility from the telephone pole, uh, a couple, a few wires coming over, overhead. Uh, it could be underground as well, but at this house, overhead, and it's tapped or spliced or connected to the service entrance conductors that goes to the house, to the equipment, um, maybe the meter disconnect and, and panel boards. The overhead service conductors, the white arrows, are, the, are also the overhead conductors between the service point, that's where they're connected at the orange arrows, and the first point of connection to the service entrance conductor, that's that cable that runs down the house at the structure. The service equipment is the necessary equipment, usually consisting of a circuit breaker or breakers, switch or switches, fuses, and their accessories connected to the load end of the service conductors to a building or designated area and intended to constitute the main control and cutoff of the supply. So let's go back to what we are required to inspect. According to the Home Inspection Standards Practice, the inspector shall inspect the service drop. And the service drop are the red arrows. That's the service drop. And th these overhead service conductors from the utility should be 10 feet above sidewalks and final grade from the bottom of the drip loop and 12 feet above yards or driveways and 18 feet above the street. And on this house, there it is there, attached to the vinyl siding is the service entrance cable. It's sheathed, it has a, a weather head, a mast up there, um, a weather head and the service entrance entrance conductors there and there's the connection points at the bottom of the drip loop and there's the overhead conductors from the utility. This is phone and, and cable on the other sides. Okay? So that's the um, the service drop is right there. Right at that point. We're required to inspect the overhead service conductors and attachment point. That's pretty easy. The overhead conductors are the white arrows and red arrows. Those are the main cables that are overhead, right? And the, um, they then go into the service entrance conductor into the equipment. The attachment point is the orange arrows, the connection between the two, the utility overhead conductors and the conductors that are coming to the equipment. The point of attachment, the tap or splice for the service drop should be below the weather head if installed. And there is no weather head or cap or anything like that installed on this service entrance. You can see it here. Service head, gooseneck, and drip loops. Well, we kind of already talked about it. Um, the service head, gooseneck, and drip loops, there's no service cap or weather head component in this inspection picture and the overhead service entrance conductors must have a 
service weatherhead or cap or an approved gooseneck. So this is a gooseneck here with some drip loops. And on this house, it's right there. There's the weatherhead service entrance, weatherhead overhead conductors, splice or connection point, and that's the drip. And the gooseneck is um, on the other one, I'm calling that a gooseneck. <laughs> and that's the weatherhead. Um, the service mast service conduit and raceway well there's no service mast or raceway it's like a pipe or conduit in this inspection picture but there is a service entrance cable right there so the SEC the service entrance cable with the conductors inside the electric meter and base that's pretty easy on this house that's what that is the main service disconnect there it is. The main service disconnect must be clearly marked. The main disconnect must be either inside or outside the house, as close to the service conductor where um, they enter the house. And it can't be in the bathroom. So you can't have a, a main disconnect in a bathroom. And no more than six breakers can be used to disconnect the service conductors. So it's commonly found nowadays one main disconnect that turns off the service conductors that disconnects them. We are required to inspect the panel boards and overcurrent protection devices, which are the circuit breakers. And there it is there. That's the main panel board, main disconnect, and the other breakers. Service grounding and bonding. And on the outside, we'll see the grounding electrode conductor, and that's that exposed, unsheathed uh, copper wire with a little patina there in the inspection image. And it's connected to the grounding electrode. That's that rod that's pounded into the ground. Um, it's the buried rod in the inspection image there. And it's, there's a clamp. Uh, the clamp has to be properly connected. And bonding. Well, bonding is required where needed to ensure the electrical continuity and the ability to carry a fault uh, current to a path to grounding. Um, the metal water pipe here um, is bonded to the service equipment enclosure, and that's by code. Electrical bonding and grounding training for home inspectors is available through InterNACHI in an online course, um, how to perform residential electrical inspections course. So if we go there, I'll show you. We have a chapter on grounding and bonding, everything you wanted to know. It starts off with what is grounding? And we talk about grounding and grounding electrodes, grounding rods, driven rods, water metal pipes, the jumper at the water meter, well casings, UFERS, grounding plates, still framing, grounding rings, electric, it goes on and on about grounding and also bonding. So on the chapter of bonding, there's the bonding components. So you don't have to be concerned about following the home inspection standards of practice after you take InterNACHI's free online courses on how to inspect a home. We are also required to inspect a representative number of switches, light fixtures, and receptacles, including AFCIs. Well, there's light fixtures. There's a switch also. There's a light fixture in the dining room and a representative number of wall receptacles like this one with my little um, tester and well there are no AFCIs. Now I took the dead front cover off of this panel and you're not required to remove a dead front cover according to the InterNACHI Home Inspection Standards of Practice. I believe currently Oklahoma Home Inspection Standards of Practice requires this um, very uh, unsafe practice it's not safe to remove the dead front. You're not required to. And according to the standards of practice, you are required to inspect all ground fault circuit interrupter receptacles. So they're often located in the garage, basement, electrical panel, bathrooms, kitchens, things like that. And there's a couple of inspection images. And the presence of smoke and carbon monoxide detectors. Smoke alarms must be powered, hardwired, and have a battery backup. They should be interconnected too. 
um, so that if one alarm goes off, the other ones go off. They should be in each bedroom, outside each bedroom sleeping area, and on each story um, of the house, including the basement. Carbon monoxide detectors, they're required for houses that have fuel-fired appliances or an attached garage with an opening to the house. Um, they should be outside of each bedroom and inside each bedroom if that bedroom has a fuel-burning fireplace or fuel-burning appliance. And they should also should be interconnected. The inspectors shall describe the main service disconnects amperage rating, if labeled, and the type of wiring observed. And so there's the amperage rating there on the main disconnect and the type of wiring observed, type NMB. The inspector shall report as in need of correction any deficiencies in the integrity of the service entrance conductor's insulation, drip loop, and vertical clearances from grade and roofs, any unused circuit breaker panel opening that was not filled, the presence of solid conductor aluminum branch circuit wiring, any tested receptacle that had problems, um, or the absence of smoke and carbon monoxide detectors. So the integrity of the service entrance conductors, well, the service entrance cable, SEC, is, looks really good. Um, any unused opening? Uh, there actually was one right here at the panel dead front cover at the bottom. So that's a major safety hazard there. Any tested receptacle that wasn't present or the polarity or the grounding was wrong. So there's a receptacle there and that's a properly wired indicator. And the absence of smoke and carbon monoxide detectors. And we actually did have um, absent smoke and carbon monoxide detectors. Fireplace. No fireplace at this house. Attic insulation and ventilation. The inspector shall inspect, according to the Home Inspection Standards of Practice, insulation in unfinished spaces, including attics, crawl spaces, and foundation areas. Ventilation in those areas, unfinished spaces, attics, crawl spaces, and foundation areas, and mechanical, mechanical exhaust systems in the kitchen, bathrooms, and laundry area. So the insulation and ventilation is pretty easy. If you go up in the attic, or crawl space, we don't have a crawl space here, but if you go up in the attic, you can take a look at the insulation and the ventilation. We talked about the ridge vent and the soffit vent and the baffles. And there's the attic there with the roof leaks and the trusses. Mechanical exhaust systems for the kitchen, bathrooms, and laundry area. Every exhaust should go outside for the kitchen, bathrooms, and laundry. The kitchen has a um, has a hood, but it doesn't exhaust outside. The bathroom has an exhaust that goes outside, and there's the vent there, and there's the dryer, and that should be fixed as well. Remember, we have a disconnected dryer vent um, behind the furnace, above and behind. The inspector shall describe the type of insulation observed and the approximate depth. So the insulation is loose fiberglass, and the depth is about 10 inches. The inspector shall report as in need of correction the general absence of insulation or ventilation in unfinished spaces, and we don't have any problems. Doors, windows, and interior. The inspector shall inspect a representative number of doors and windows by opening and closing them. Well, and also, sorry, the floors, walls, and ceilings, stairs, steps, landings, stairways, and ramps, railings, guards, and handrails, garage vehicle doors, and the operation of garage vehicle door openers using controls. Well, you can group the interior in, again, all in one thing called the interior, or maybe group the laundry like we did here as part of this interior part, right? So here's the laundry area. It's a room within the system of the interior. And we have um, rubber hoses that are not pressure tested, so they need to be replaced. There's the outlet, GFCI, no water catch pan underneath the second floor laundry. Bathrooms, we grouped all the bathrooms together. It's really optional for you, so there's the full bath in the basement, sink, GFCI, shower. There's the full bathroom for the second floor, shared bathroom. We have that damaged flooring by the bathroom, tub, GFCI, panel. And there's the half bath downstairs, first floor, toilet, sink, and GFCI. The inspector shall describe a garage door vehicle as manual or automatic, and we don't have any garages. 
The inspector shall report as in need of correction in proper spacing between the intermediate balusters, spindles, rails for steps, stairways, guards, and railings. The photoelectric safety eyes on the garage door opener that did not operate properly in any window that was obviously fogged or displayed other evidence of broken seals. And we actually have a, a few windows that are cracked. That's a hole in that one. And there's two window panes that have fogged window panes or seals broken. And there's some receptacles, there's doors, more receptacles, light switches, more receptacles, windows opening and closing the windows. Sometimes they you can't access them because there's so much stuff in the middle in between. There's a lot of inspection restrictions. And there's a watermark um, in the ceiling of the first floor. And it could be a plumbing leak. I didn't see any plumbing leaks. Or it could be a roof leak coming all the way down. I'm not sure. But let's say it's a roof leak. So from the roof section of the standards of practice, the inspector shall report as in need of correction any observed indications of active roof leaks. If it's an active plumbing leak, you ought to observe that as well and put it in the report. Kitchen was grouped. There's the kitchen sink, hot on the left, cold on the right. No plumbing leaks, except the tailpiece is a little loose and may have leaked in the past. Turn on the dishwasher, GFCIs. The stove, electric stove, electric oven needs to be attached to the wall for safety, and there's the exhaust. And that is how you perform a home inspection according to the standards of practice. And if you wanted to watch certified master inspectors perform inspections and write reports, that's on NACHI TV, N A C H I dot TV. And all of InterNACHI courses are free and online for members, and all of NACHI TV videos are free and open to everyone. So careful, don't feel obligated to spend thousands of dollars getting trained and certified to perform home inspections through InterNACHI School, the only home inspection college, uh, college for home inspectors in the United States. Um, and NACHI TV videos are, are free. Um, everything is free and online for our members. So here's me performing an inspection and writing an inspection report at the same time. And there's many other, there's Jim Crum performing an inspection and there's Greg Bell from Florida performing an inspection and Juan Garcia performing an inspection. So um, follow along certified master inspectors as they perform home inspections. And the standards of practice, the InterNACHI home inspection standards of practice are at nachi.org slash SOP. Use that as the foundation upon which you build a really great inspection and write a great report. Everything you need all in one place is at nachi.org slash everything. And remember, InterNACHI runs a school. It's a free online accredited college for home inspectors. We're the only tuition free accredited college for home inspectors. And it's free for InterNACHI members. You join InterNACHI and everything else is free, including the accredited courses and the nationally accredited certifications, including the Certified Professional Inspector CPI designation. Thank you very much. My name is Ben Gramico. I'm from InterNACHI, and we just performed a home inspection according to the Home Inspection Standards of Practice. Bye, everybody.